أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وبه نستعين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا بالقاسم محمد وعلى إطرة الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعلى محمد وعلى محمد وعلى محمد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to Real Talk um, This week we have Dr. Shahina Yusuf Gulamali with us Assalamu alaikum Shahina Alaikum salam how, how are you? I'm good and you? Alhamdulillah, thank you. Um, if I can ask you to just introduce yourself to the viewers, please. Okay, so um, uh, my name is Dr. Shaina Yusuf Kulamali, and uh, I am an emergency physician by profession. Um, and recently I have uh, been dealing with uh, drug addicts, alcohol addicts, any substance, uh, substance abuse uh, addicts for past one year plus. plus. When you say you've been dealing with them, is that in the emergency room or outside of the emergency room? So no, um, past few years since I have become an emergency physician, I was dealing with them in the hospitals, uh, um, in emergency rooms, uh, outpatients. Uh, but recently I've opened a rehab center where we cater for the drug addicts and we try to help them get over their addiction in uh, various ways including medical treatment and uh, counseling and the programs that are available and you said you've opened this center um what made you decide to do that so honestly uh the problem is huge um and the problem is huge not only in general public but also in our community and uh all right. Can I can I just um, stop you? I'm sorry. Um, when you say in our community, are you talking about the the Muslims, the Shias, the Khojas, uh, and and where are you based as well? So I am in Dar es Salaam, and the problem is huge in Muslim community. I'm not only talking about Khoja community, um, and it's huge. It's just not being addressed. Um, in uh, general population, the problem is there definitely, but. I never realized the problem is huge in the Muslim community, in our Koja community, and uh, it needs to be addressed. And when so I, I suppose, speaking, sorry, yes. I, I suppose as uh, if you think about the fact that if we're Muslim, you know, the fact that we're Muslims, we believe in a God, um, and that should be enough. Then why why would we need to turn to drugs or substance abuse or anything like that? Um, it it. I, the two don't go hand in hand and that's probably why we feel like you know drug addiction cannot happen if you uh, if you have islam um and, and obviously you're saying no that, that's not how it works True. is that correct um if you see history even during prophet's time uh, even his ashabas were going through uh, phases in life and they would opt for things that are not legal or not islamically uh, you know acceptable but then there is always supposed to be a guide, some somebody where some people can, you know, go for for guidance or ask for help. And uh, in our part of the world, these things are not readily available, like the helplines, you know, the free helplines or the centers where people can just walk in and get the help they need. So we don't unfortunately have those kind of help, uh, you know, uh, where people can actually seek help from. Um, anonymous helplines are very helpful, I believe, uh, in a lot of countries, but we do not have them here. So I really believe anybody can go astray. Anybody can slip into something that they don't know, actually. And if you hear their stories, majority of them don't know what they are doing. By the time they do realize, they are far in the addiction and they cannot quit. And that's where we come in place. But uh, our aim is not only taking care of those who are uh, already addicted. Our aim is also helping those who are not yet addicted and can be helped not getting into the addiction. So, for so example, education. yes, for example, you know, posting in media. Media is a very powerful tool and a lot of youths are using media from Instagram to Facebook to Twitter to LinkedIn. And this is one way of, uh, you know, um, bringing the awareness educating the population if not the youths themselves even the parents who are a lot of times don't know the loved ones don't know 
what their loved ones are going through uh, or are already addicted because they don't know. So what are the signs and the symptoms? How do you help them? How, what help is available and what can they do from their side? They, they are basically in the darkness. They don't know if they can help. They are just tired by the time they realize that they, their loved one is in addiction. They are so much tired of that life. They are tired of how to help them. You know, some of them have become bankrupt. Some of them have health issues. Some of them also need help uh, as family members because addiction is not one person's uh, problem. It is basically affecting the entire surrounding of that one person. So family, friends, workplaces, all these play places and people get affected by that one person being an addict. So what, what are the signs and symptoms as, as um, parents can we look out for um, which would maybe alert us so that we can actually have those conversations with our children? And what sort of conversations should we be having as well? So first of all, I would uh, want to say this, this is a very important thing that uh, uh, instead of attacking and uh, judging the parents or the loved ones should, you know, um, try and support. The, the words that you choose are very important. How you talk to that person is very important. If we get angry or if we become abusive verbally or even physically, that's not going to help. Remember, these uh, people are, some of them are in such a state that they really want to leave, but they can't because their bodies are used to it. So they, uh, they end up having withdrawals or they feel, already they feel depressed that, oh my God, I, I can't even live without this substance. So by getting angry at them, by reacting negatively, as it is the society is talking of, you know, is not letting them in into their society. There is so much stigma. By talking to them in a very positive way, by uh, assisting, by, uh, you know, giving them help or showing that, that, that we can help them in one way or the other makes a difference. So some signs, uh, since you asked about the signs and the symptoms, some signs are common across all substance abuse and some are very specific. So I'll talk about what are common in uh, across all the uh, substances. More, um, uh, one of them is finances. So you will see that they always uh, are lack of funds, are in lack of funds. So if, they, if it is a youth who is getting pocket money, they always run out of it and nobody knows where that money went, for, you know, where they spent mm -hmm. that uh, money uh, for. Um, the other thing is appetite. A lot of drugs either make them eat more or eat less. Majority of them, uh, they, they eat less because they want to use that money uh, for their substance. So you will see they, they have poor appetite. And uh, even if they have been given food, they will not be able, they are not able to finish that portion. They are not eating well. And thus you will see weight loss in a lot of uh, substances. The other thing is sleep disturbance. A lot of these drugs or alcohol are, are um, substances that are stimulants. So you will see that they are not able to sleep early, on time rather, and they are sleeping until late. Uh, and if they are sleeping until late, then other signs and symptoms will happen that they will not be able to go to work on time. They will not be able to focus in school or at work. Then what will follow is, fall, you know, they will come out of work or fall out of school. So uh, if these, it's performing, yeah. Sorry, these, these symptoms, these signs that you've actually mentioned, um, whether it's, um, you know, using their money too quickly, not having, in, not having much money because they've used it, or whether it's, um, you know, uh, lack of appetite or eating less or whether it's um, not, not, you know, sleeping, not sleeping till really late, staying awake and they're not being able to get up in the morning. And they sound very much like teenagers. <laughs> there doesn't yes. seem to be much, you know, it's, it's like what you would normally is associate with a, a normal teenager. So how, again, would a parent be able to tell this is normal teenage behavior and this is this is something slightly different and I need to dwell in, into it a little bit more deeper just to make sure that there's nothing more in there. So, so for those who are using uh, illicit drugs, usually they will lose interest in what they usually had interest in. So if they were interested in sports, you will see slowly they are, you know, they are no longer interested in sports. They want to hang out uh, with a specific group of people 
uh, or group of uh, youngsters or not with anybody because they are scared that they will be discovered or mm -hmm. they will hang out with that specific group of people where they he knows that this secret will remain a secret because they all hang out together and do stuff together so, so they I will suppose here we're, to, sorry so here i suppose you're look you're making sure you know what what your who your children's yeah. friends are yes okay and their whereabouts for example if you are giving pocket money i mean it's it's okay if they're spent in food or buying a toy or you know um, a gadget or a book but if you don't know where they're spending the money it's important as a parent to know or to ask where did you use this money okay um and it all starts from the beginning if you let them go out there and buy stuff on their own for example if you let them go out and buy uh, whatever they like as gadgets for example for teenagers then when you question and question them they will feel like you know, now my parents are interfering. Where is my freedom? I need to, I'm an adult now, you know. But there are, again, there are ways of doing this. Uh, maybe you can tell them, you have this pocket money, we can go together and see what you like and we can buy it together. But if it is not from before, it is very hard to instill these things later on when they are already on their own. So it's ensuring that as parents, we, we're quite involved with our children's life, you know, in our children's lives from a very early age so that it then it continues into when they become a little bit older. Definitely. And I see the difference, the generation gap, how we were brought up and how uh, today's generation is. We never used to ask why or what, but right now all kids want to know why, what, how, when, and we should not react to that. Why did you ask me this question? We should be, you know, we should lower our ourselves and be in their, you know, state of mind and talk and discuss. We should be open for discussion. If we are not open from before for discussion, whether it is something that we like to talk about or not, then they are not going to be able to talk to us about it. So if we show them that if you go out of this particular norm that we are used to, then it's unacceptable and not even you know not even allowed to discuss these things then they're not going to come and discuss with us mm -hmm. and i believe all schools have counselors and i was uh, hearing a um, few of the lectures or the talks that the counselors were giving and they were saying the, that they feel more comfortable with the counselors who they meet few hours maybe a week or a month but they are not comfortable with their own parents and it's something that we should think about that we are growing up with them they are growing up around us we are instilling these values in them and they are not comfortable coming to talk to, to us why is it we should ask ourselves maybe we are showing them or portraying that negative you know uh, negativity that i'm going to react or i'm going to judge you while the counselors even if they know something is wrong but they do not show that they are judging and it's okay as a parent to feel bad uh, about what your child has done, which is not uh, acceptable in your values. But only if you react positively, then you can help him. But if you react negatively, that oh my God, how could you do that? Our son from these values, from this background, what will I show? You know, how will I show my face to my family? Then they are not going to come and tell you, even if it is something that is bothering them. And a lot of these youth go into uh, substance abuse because they cannot share their emotion. So they keep it so much inside that they do not, they feel so bad, they don't know what to do about it. Then they end up using something to make them feel good. And every time then when they feel bad, they will go look for that thing to make them feel good. And okay, so I, I just... Yeah, I, I just want to just um, sort of just recap everything because you've said quite a lot of things there. And, and I think I just want to just make it clear in my head um, and, and help the viewers to sort of remember all the things that you said. So it's having those open conversations with, with our with our children so that they feel comfortable talking to about us, uh, coming to us and talking about everything and anything. Um, right. Secondly, you said not to judge and the fact that the counsellors don't judge, but it's easier for the counsellors not to judge because they're not emotionally invested. We are, as mothers, we're obviously emotionally invested in our children. So it would be very difficult not to judge, but maybe come across from the perspective of um, 
I, I don't know. I'm, I was just thinking when you were talking, maybe if, if I had a conversation with my child and said to my child, look, if, if, you know, you will make, you will make mistakes. We all make mistakes in our lives. But when you make right. a mistake, you know, if you come and tell me rather than me hearing it from someone else or rather than you telling other people and trying to get help from other people who, who, are not as invested in you who don't love you as much as i do who don't care about yeah. you as much as i do um then you know when you come to me yes of course i'll be disappointed and yes of course i'll be upset but you know what what will be at the forefront of my mind is how can i help you and and that's yes. what we've got to work with and so it's it's sort of being yeah. being real and saying you know i i i will be upset yes i will be i, I i'm human i'm your mother i am going to be upset when yeah. something hurts you of course it's going to hurt me um but at the same time I I love you more than anyone else in this world loves you. And I, I'm gonna help you. I'm not gonna abandon you. I'm not gonna throw you aside. Um, we're gonna we'll work through it. Whatever mistake you make, whatever it is, whether it's drug abuse, um, you know, substance abuse or or even anything else that they do, anything that as if they feel comfortable enough coming to me, then we can work through it. And I think it's opening up that door and, and making sure that they do know that they can come to me uh, as a parent. Um if they do something wrong is, is that what you're saying exactly exactly you put it very nicely very clearly and uh, as you said uh, it's very true it is not easy not only for the mother for any person who is emotionally attached to you know not show emotions but uh, even i at this stage with the one year ex uh, experience with directly with the uh, you know uh, substance abuse uh, people i also still learn okay so there are ways as i said they are they are positive tones they are positive words that you can use uh instead of uh, negative words negative attitude or punishing tone or a punishing statement you, you understand that way they can feel comfortable but again this has to start earlier on if they are already deep into addiction, then they're not going to hear you or the counselor because for them, in their mind frame, it's what is the right thing to do. I can't live without this and I'm doing it. I know they don't know. So they are okay. They can judge me because they don't know what I'm going through. But if the positive uh, positivity in our talks or getting, you know, from before, if we are closer to our kids, then it is easier for them to approach, even for us to approach. Even for us, if you come so, to know that I, something is wrong, you know, the, the way you're going to talk to, they're not going to even listen if, if from before you don't have that uh, attachment. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, so I suppose we're, we're looking at preventing rather than curing the, the addiction. So actually getting to a stage where we're trying to prevent the addiction. Um, so having those, making sure we're having conversations with our children, making sure we're close with our children so we know if there is a, a, a very big change in their in their moods, in their attitudes. And it's, so it's, you know, it's not what would be considered as normal teenage hormonal change, but it would be something that's huge, um, you know, that you would actually think this this isn't normal. Um, and then even if you, you know, even if you're not sure, maybe actually asking them straight out, um, is, is that something that's advisable to actually ask them straight out or would they be defensive so, if you ask? So a lot of parents ask me, is it okay to talk about drugs when we are not sure whether they are using or not? So the conversation can be as if uh, the parent is a bit uh, alarmed with the society using so much drugs and what the kid or the youth thinks about it, what are his views, and then slowly you can see what are their views. Are Does the youth think it's okay to use or because maybe they are using or they feel like, no, it's something really destructive at the end. Again, it comes to, you know, uh, if you start a conversation just by uh, judging them or showing them that I know what you're doing, then they're not going to be uh, able to open up. But if you say that maybe I heard my friend's, uh, you know, daughter or son or uh, younger sibling is, you know, affected with drugs and these are the problems that they are going through. And for me, it was a very big shock. Do you really think if the problem is such big in our, in our society, in our population? And you see where the conversation is going on. And uh, a lot of times, uh, since I was talking about youths, as you clearly said, that this is these are normal things that sometimes we see in teenagers. But now this is the age where they want to experiment. Mm. So a lot of these clients that we receive, they might be in their 40s. 
But the first time or the first few times they had started was when they were teenagers. And they already knew what it did to them. So when they did have bigger problems and they didn't know who to go to, then they end up going to where they felt better. So it is an age for experimentation, not only for illicit drugs, but for a lot of things. Okay. So what, what you're saying is that um, as youth, they may have experimented, but not got actually drawn into it. Yes. But then as adults, they've gone back to it, remembering what it felt like and that sort of feeling of, um, you yeah. know, letting go and, and not, you know, not having the, the, the burdens on their shoulders while, while they were high. Um, so yeah. wanting yeah. that feeling again, then getting addicted as adults. Um, but I suppose even if they haven't experimented as youth, they can still get drawn into the drug culture as, as adults, right? I mean, it's not something yeah. that's just yeah. explicit, implicitly only for youth. It's, it's for every age and every gender, yeah. right? Yeah. Any gender as well. Yeah. Okay. So addiction choose. It can affect any gender any uh, ethnicity, any level of education, it can affect anybody. Even religion does not, I, I know you from the beginning, you said that if it is the God's path, then how can you go for drugs and not for something, you know, which is positive. But I have seen myself witnessed clients that are from very religious background. They've been exposed to a lot of religious, uh, you know, upbringing, but they, you know, end up being in drugs. Again, it comes, I really think that everybody has different stresses in life, but then how you react to that stress is what support system you have around you really matters. I suppose, and when, when you mentioned, I mean, um, when you mentioned that, you know, you could have people coming from very religious backgrounds, um, in my mind, I'm thinking, well, if, if you're a child in a very religious uh, family, then there are certain expectations um, that are yeah. put on you. Um, like if you're a child who's born into a very, um, you know, um, sort of, I don't know, a family where, you know, you, everyone's a doctor. So, again, there's a huge uh, sort of pressure put on you to to do well, you know, academically or do well religiously or do well sport wise or do well. And, and those those pressures probably then if you feel that you're letting your family down could be something that may actually pull you towards um, using drugs. Is that not correct? Yes. So you're absolutely right. Uh, some of them do feel that pressure that I'm expected. I'm from the doctor's family, so I'm expected to be a doctor. But I don't want to be a doctor. I want to be an engineer or I want to be an, an accountant. But who is going to understand me? That's frustration itself. It's a, it's a stressor that they feel that they cannot talk to anybody who can understand them. And again, it will come back down to how you talk to your youths they have to feel comfortable to come and talk to you about anything. It's very hard for parents to do that because there are certain limitations in our cultures as well. It's, you, there are certain topics. It's a no-no to talk to your parents about it. But then at least there should be a support system, closer cousins or you know older siblings who they can confide into and talk about how their feelings are because a lot of them are emotionally traumatized. If you see, they don't have a place to take it out. They inter internalize it, and then they go use these illicit drugs that you know uh, make them feel better, you know, and temporarily forget about the problems. And then when they do remember, or it hits in them again, they end up uh, using it again. And slowly, their bodies get used to it so much that they cannot have a normal life or a normal day until they use it. I suppose, it, I mean, you, you, we, we've been talking a lot about um, about us as parents and, and our children, but like you said, drugs can affect every, every, every anyone at all. Um, so even in a relationship, I mean, like sort of with my spouse or, you know, um, yeah. with my friends, um, if I am not there supporting them and I'm the one who's putting more pressure on them and putting more stress. So, for example, if, if my, as a wife, if I'm, you know, um, putting so much pressure on my husband, that you know um, he feels like he can't talk to me and he doesn't have anyone else he can talk to, then I'm the one who's actually sort of pushing him towards. I'm not. Put, I'm not trying to blame anyone. I'm not trying to put the blame on yes, anyone. Yes, but I'm just yes. trying to look from a perspective of, as you know, we, we are very much um, you know human beings who need each other. We, we, you know, yes, we have we have God, and obviously you know 
we, we need to have a relationship with God, but we also need each other. So yes. whichever relationship yes. we're in, whether it's with our parents, whether it's with our spouses, whether it's with our children, we need to make sure that we are um, behaving and, and talking and and um, supporting that person rather than yes. constantly putting them down Maybe. and making them feel useless. And yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I think well, that, that's what I'm getting from you. To work as well. So I have had a few clients who had extreme pressures at work and mm. they could not cope at work. So they would go and use a drug and feel good about it and come back and work, you know, and forget uh, that my boss was yelling at me half an hour ago. And uh, similarly, as you said, a lot of them don't want to go back to home because there is a new partner at home. And so afterward, friends, some friends use different kind of drugs or alcohol and they get fooled in it to the point mm -hmm. that some people don't go back home from club. They go straight to work again next day. Yeah. So mm -hmm. again, it's a support system everywhere. Somewhere, somebody has to have that support system. And we all are very different personalities. Some of the, some of us are very open. We like to vocal, be vocal and express our feelings. But some of them are not like that, who internalize everything. And it reaches a point where they need to get, you know, they need to feel better or they are going to go crazy. And that is why a lot of these uh, substance abuse are related or linked to depression and some other mental health issues because that is uh, one of the branches that is affecting um, these kind of people who go into the addiction. I suppose here I'm, I'm thinking from my perspective, it's like I, I'm, I'm someone who probably would never think of actually ever using drugs or, you know, even smoking or anything like that. Um, but maybe I'm, again, I don't know because I've not been put in a situation where I would feel the need to, um, alhamdulillah, up to now, but I could even, you know, at, I could be sitting there thinking, okay, I may not use it, but how am I helping or pushing someone else into feeling that they they can't come to me and 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 you know um, ask for help from me? So maybe I sh the reflection for me would be, am I supporting the people around me? Am I positive uh, for the with the people around me, or am I so negative and so soul destructing to to the other people around me that? they feel like they can't talk to me and they they need a way out rather than coming towards me right. I, I don't know am i making sense yes definitely and and it's true in every aspect of our lives as a mother as a wife as a boss as a you know as a colleague are you a repelling person are you a person people are drawn to and easily talking no. to and how are you are you a good listener or you just like talk all these things matter and yeah. what is worse is the way these things are stigmatized. First of all is the approach that even if it is a normal problem, are you an approachable person? But then yeah. the second bit of it is about stigma. These things are a big no-no in a lot of communities, a lot of population, a lot of mm -hmm. societies. And to come and talk about, you know, to approach somebody and tell them I'm using drugs, they are scared to be judged because this yeah. is the norm. Everybody has been judging them. And as I said, there reaches a time where they really want to stop. It's not they don't want to. But the side effects, the withdrawals of not using these drugs are so severe that they end up, you know, their their emotions of wanting to stop is overwhelmed by the physical experiences that are having, they're having for the withdrawal. And they end up using it. Some of them even cry while using it because they don't want to use it. But they know if they don't use it, they're going to die or they're going to be so sick that they won't be able to function and everybody will know and everybody will judge them. So even it's not just, sorry, sorry, it's not just them that are going to be judged, right? It's going to be the whole family because it's like if yes, my child yes. is on drugs or if my husband's on drugs then it's not just going to be him or her that's yes. going to be judged, it's the whole family. Yes. It's like there must be something wrong with the family. That's why that's why that person went down that road. Yes, yes definitely. Uh, what is worse is even when these guys get clean, out of the rehab and want to go out there for them to go back in the society is so hard nobody wants to give them a job nobody wants to give them any responsibility nobody wants to even associate with them in any work even if they want to do volunteering work people don't want 
because of their history, because of they're scared that they, they don't believe, first of all, that somebody can live without drugs and there's something called, uh, you know, recovery. They don't believe that. They think that once somebody is in drugs, that it, of course, there are relapses. But then again, the reasons for relapse are, are similar of them going back to drugs. Similar experiences they experience again, and they feel like I might as well go back to using it if I'm getting, if I'm clean, people are reacting like this. When I'm using, people are reacting like that. I might as well go and use it again. Yeah, so uh, it's, it's a lot of, again, positivity that comes out of your personality as a person, as a parent. Again, for parents, I cannot only I can only imagine what they go through. Yeah, it's very difficult as a parent. But again, uh, as I told you, even I learn how to talk to them by watching different programs, by watching different uh, the people who are actually specialized in these things. Their talks are online. I Google, I YouTube a search how to talk to youths about you know how to even bring up these topics because you might end up talking to a youth who is not using. And after knowing what it does, might want to go and experiment. Wow. It's very hard. Yeah. So there are there are lines to draw. There are there are ways of talking. As I said, you can put a situation in front of them, and then you know want their views. They also want to feel important. They feel like, wow, my mom, mom or my dad wants to know what are my views about this problem, and what mm. I think. What would I do if I knew a friend who was using? How would I help? Yeah. Uh, another thing is a lot of people even wanting to ask for help because it is stigmatizing for parents, for example, if they're not sure. How are parents going to be sure whether their kids are using or not? What are they supposed to do? What are they supposed to know about using and not using? Yeah. And even if they are, let's say they find out they're using, how to get help? Not all cases need rehab. If the mm -hmm. early phases of addiction, counseling and support, because there is enabling of uh, an addict and there is supporting of the, uh, an addict. Enabling means you are going to let him use because emotionally it is overwhelming for you as a loved one, whether it is a parent or a partner. But supporting means you want to stop them using, but showing them that you care. That is why. So there are different, uh, you know, there, there are different support systems that are available. We are also available online. We are we do free consultation because there are no helplines here. So they don't know where to get help. By the time they actually do decide to open up and ask for help, the problem is very deep. So someone's actually asked on here, um, they, they're saying, Salaam Alaikum, in your clinic, do you find drug abuse to be mostly a male or a female orientated problem or equally an, an issue for both genders and in either case, why? All right, so we uh, have a male rehab first because the ratio worldwide, the ratio is two to one, uh, male being two and uh, females being uh, one. And I always ask myself why, but I believe because females are very emotional. They end up talking and crying and looking for a shoulder to, you know, to uh, look for support. Um, while men are actually not, allowed to show their emotions unfortunately this is worldwide men are not allowed to cry men are supposed to be strong men are but they have emotions too so i so believe men, yes so men uh, to women ratio is two to one so we mm -hmm. have only male rehab at the moment uh, but we do have free counseling sessions or consultations over the phone or we can direct them to rehabs that are for females and they can get a health payment. So um, you said you were based in Dar es Salaam. Um, I'm just coming from London, UK. Um, I'm just trying to think that the, the stigma that you keep talking about must be so much more in, in Dar es Salaam than it is in London. How are you coping with that? And what was the view of you know friends and family when you decided to open up this rehab center? Uh, it, it's, um, it was very emotional because uh, my husband is very open-minded, alhamdulillah. He, he said, are you sure you want to do this? You are a woman uh, and drug addicts and uh, addicts as, as in addicts are not easy to handle. Are you sure you're going to be able to handle this? And I said, yeah, I want to try. I want to give my best. If I can't, then I will, you know, ask for help. 
um, or I'll close down, but I want to do this. And so as my parents, so my dad, uh, he was like, it's not going to be easy. You know, these guys are crazy. They can attack you. They can, you know, they have also, men also mental health issues. Are you really sure you want to do this? And when I said yes, they were all very supportive, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Now, a lot of other societies were really surprised, me being a woman, I want to open a, fee, a, a male rehab center, and how am I going to manage this? But uh, I personally never found, uh, even during before planning or during planning, I never found that I probably won't be able to do it. And uh, I feel that uh, with a woman's touch in my rehab is something very, very unique and very positive because they look at me like their mothers. So in all other rehabs, a lot of rehabs here or sober houses, we call them, there, there is just a manager who is their gender manager and they are very strict and there is, there is no motherly touch. So for example, food, I will maybe go an extra mile and make, uh, you know, carrot uh, no otano and take it for them so that they feel the spice a bit, you know, or maybe go out of my way and bring them different type of fruits uh, to make them feel at home. So I, we try to make it a very home environment because again, they are away from home, they are away from family. And once they go through medical detox, their emotions start coming up and they need this. So Alhamdulillah. So why, so, why not? Um, you, I mean, there are other rehab centers there that you could have gone and worked with or why why did they, why did you decide to open up your own okay a very good question thank you Marsuma. so we have a lot of sober houses here in tanzania and in dar especially in dar there are a lot of uh, sober houses we call them sober houses because they don't have a strategic plan to do things they're very they're quite different than how a rehab center is so there are a lot of people in one small house uh, they, it's not like a syllabus or things are not done for them. For example, cooking, cleaning, laundry, everything they do themselves. Here, we tried to make it very different uh, so that they can feel again like home, not like prison, not where they are brought so that they get punished. They are brought here so that we can help them together with themselves to, you know, go back on track. Uh, so. It's a very home environment. We have a garden, we have a farm where they are, you know, they can farm with us if they wish. There's a little gym if they wish. We don't push them to do certain things. There are compulsory things like attending sessions, which are compulsory. But uh, we try to keep it very home environment. So I was the first one in the country to open. And uh, I believe there are others who are following. But uh, it was it was like an ideal setup which is not like other houses so i um, i suppose you're you're looking at the um addiction as an illness rather than as a a choice which they did where they're going to be punished for because it's something absolutely, that they did which was wrong absolutely addiction is a, a disorder it's not something somebody wishes to have you know maybe they did try to experiment something uh, and uh, into the experiment they went into the addiction but it is not it is not a normal thing where somebody can just come out of it it's just like normal other diseases i always give example of the diabetes people have diabetes they have to follow rules they have to have medication they have to have uh, a, a, a different set of lifestyle in order to control diabetes if you follow the rules if you take the medication if you follow the diet the diabetes is going to be, you know, in its normal range. But if you don't follow all these things, the sugar levels are not going to be in the so normal range. Of course, there are ups and downs. Maybe there is a, a stress in the family or something happens, infection happens, and your sugar rises. Similarly to the addiction, there are events that can happen. You can lose a loved one, a parent, a, a child, a partner, or work issues, work stress. And again, you might feel like, oh, my God, overwhelmed and I want to go back to what was giving me the, you know, the ease, the peace that I used to get. But if you have the enough support system, who that is where we also do different things in rehab. We do family therapy. 
whereby mm -hmm. we tell them if you see something that is out of the norm, if you see a stressor like a death in the family or work pressure, then you have to alert us so that we can do from our side, we can pull him up, you know? So mm -hmm. it's absolutely right. It's like a disorder. It's not something somebody wants to be, you know? We need I to suppose, give them a chance. I, I love the example that you gave of, of uh, diabetes, especially if it's secondary diabetes, because obviously it's not something you're born with. And it's because yes. of our indulgences in eating too much sugar or overeating and so forth that we've actually done this to ourselves but no one actually looks at someone who's got diabetes and says oh my god you know you're you're so bad and it's like you deserve it and you know you're, you're you know and, and no one judges that person so it's yes. it, although it is our own fault that to a certain extent that we got it because of our bad eating habits and the choices that we made which were detrimental to ourselves without meaning to be detrimental to ourselves. And, and I suppose Absolutely. it's the same sort of principle. So it's, it's a beautiful example you've given. How do you rate your um, success in your clinic? So Alhamdulillah, we majority of our boys, I would say 85% of our boys who have come out have not relapsed. That is number one. Number two, they like coming back. So if it was <laughs> a place where, where they felt like, oh my God, it was a torture. They would never feel like coming back. They like coming back. They come spend a day. Some of them spend two days. Some of them will call you back. Maybe remember them in their happy days. Maybe if they are getting married or if they got a job, they'll call you and remember you. And that for me is a success. You know, they, so they don't they relax in order like to come back. Home. Yes. So they feel like it is home and they want to come back. They want to be associated with uh, with with where they came from. Always, they like my posts, they follow my page, and for me that is good because that means they are on track. At least they are around, you know, they are happy with what they are seeing, what they felt when they left. They weren't tortured, you know. So for me that is success. And if I can turn around a couple of, if not one, life, that will mean a lot for me. How many, how many people do you have in your clinic? I mean, what, what's the sort at of... At the moment, at the moment, four. But uh, over the year, uh, we have uh, seen and uh, released 20 youths. 20 wow, years. that's amazing. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. Have you had any negative um, sort of retaliation or negative um, press or anything that you've, you know, you've had negativity that you've had to sort of put up with by opening up this rehab center? Yes, yes. Um, one of them is... Uh, People cannot afford, and I have to run uh, this place. So as I told you, everything is done for them. I need to pay salaries. So a lot the the people who cannot afford, uh, I approach their normal, their direct community. So if it is Jamaat, then I approach their Jamaats. If it is not belonging to any Jamaats, we try to fundraise for them. Uh, once we have sufficient funds, we can take them uh, for free so that they don't have to worry about the funds. Uh, that is one. Two, but there are so many out there who cannot afford it. Two, it's a uh, family. See, somebody who has been addicted for 20 years, you cannot expect me to make an impact in one or two months. It's going to take a while. Just them to learn to uh, trust somebody, share their feelings and emotions, take a very good few months, you understand? So until mm. they end, end up talking about their addiction and how bad it was and, you know, understanding their addiction and getting over it and grasping the program that we use at our rehab, it's going to take a while. So mm. we usually tell them minimum 90 days in-house, they have to stay. And so everybody has that in their mind that 90 days, then I, my son is going to come out. And then he's going to be clean, like he will forget what was in his past. It doesn't work that way. It's very hard. And that is why we make such an environment where they can feel like coming back. The day they feel like they are craving for it, they know who to call. You see, we also try and keep a lot of uh, family, I mean, quite a number of close family members in the loop during family counseling, the, the near ones, of course, the parent or the sibling or the partner or a child. And we try and explain them that this is not abracadabra. It's going to take a while until they learn to live with the new uh, reformed life lifestyle. So just like mm -hmm. diabetes, it's very hard for a new diabetic patient 
to reform their life and go for exercise and eat less and eat healthy and more veggies and less carb but with time when they get used to it it's normal for them and then mm. they don't try as hard but it takes a while until they get used to it and that support system even at home should be there yeah, so if the husband is diabetic and the wife keeps on cooking sweet things, <laughs> it's not going to work, yeah? So there has yeah. to be a support system even for the addicts that the mother should act this way when the, when, when the son is out, not this way, or the partner or the sibling, you know, not to judge mm -hmm. them the way they used to judge them. Give them that chance to show their trust again. All these things, small, 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 small things, but they really matter. So this is a major, major uh, uh, impact that I'm feeling that why, why parents are not understanding me. But then what I see and what I hear is not what they do. And that is, why, that is why we really try to involve the family. Sometimes it is very hard to involve them because they are not reciprocating the willingness to be part of it. But then all we can do is try. So we try to involve the family to, to build a support system so that when this youth or this person that goes out there doesn't find himself suddenly stranded where he came out from a, a good, solid support system. You also mentioned that you had a, a, a phone in line that people could um, contact you through? So it's my personal line at the moment. So, uh, and uh, people can call me anonymously. We have uh, email, uh, our rehab email, where they can email us anonymously. Uh, recently, I've seen that youth are using it to not to consult, but to get information uh, on what kind of work we do um, and what do we cater for and how bad is a particular drug, what are the side effects long term and short term. Uh, more of youths are doing that. So it can be anonymous, absolutely. and. Uh, you don't wish to say your name or so that we don't follow you up that is fine but we we are trying it's very hard to have a 24 uh, hour hotline at the moment but that is the long-term plan that we can have hotline which is 24 7 and people can call any time of the day inshallah we pray that you're able to manage to do that um the name of your center i don't think you've mentioned the name of your center up to now our, the our center name is the awaited rehab center the awaited rehab center right like the await like the awaited imam that we're waiting for yes absolutely <laughs> so um alhamdulillah when i did think about this uh, i was constantly thinking how can i make my imam happy how can i make the youths that uh, are waiting for imam to wait in a positive way not by using drugs by getting them clean so that was one of the reasons that uh, the name is there for Imam. Beautiful, beautiful. I'm sure most of the viewers will not forget that name, the Awaited Rehab Center in Dar es Salaam. Amazing. Um, we're actually coming to the end of, of our talk. Um, before we finish, I usually ask, ask my guests um, to give three pieces of advice to the viewers uh, from their life experiences, um, from you know what they've been through and what they've learned. And maybe if you'd like to share that with us, just three pieces of advice, please. They are going to talk or I'm going to give them? Uh, no, no, you're, you're going to give us the advice. All right, so I'm going to give you a few advice. I want, first of all, to say, don't judge. It can happen to anybody. It doesn't matter what age, it doesn't matter what uh, ethnicity, it doesn't matter what gender. A lot of people judge by saying, ah, a girl is smoking weed. But yes, it can happen to anybody. Uh, so do not judge. Be positive. Be uh, you know, uh, responsive towards somebody who is seeking for help. Second thing I would like to say that... Can I, can I just say... Just yes. to just to emphasize the point, um, because I think this is a really important point. You know, we always constantly say not to judge and we tell people not to judge. But again, I think like, you know, the, the saying goes, unless you've walked in their shoes, you really don't know what they're going through. And and I remember um, when I was working as a, as a prison chaplain and talking to the women there. And I remember actually sitting there thinking, if I had been living that woman's life, what's to say that I wouldn't have made the same choices and ended up in prison like she has? Because it's really easy, you know, when you've got a, 
a normal life with everything going well and it, it's really easy to think oh god how you know why would you need drugs you know what what's what's wrong with you you know you're so weak and things but you really don't know what the other person's going through in their life and and Absolutely. outside everything may look you know fine and, and wonderful but it you, we don't know what's going on in their life so this this is really really important not just with drugs but with anything i think we know uh, as human beings we need not to judge others because we really are not walking in their shoes yeah definitely, we don't. definitely. and uh, honestly there are so many motivational uh, videos out there when you hear their stories it's it's uh, mind boggling it's not easy what uh, a lot of them have gone through it's not easy so if they did end up going into drugs, my second advice is here is if you cannot help, don't do harm. Don't say bad things to them. Don't, uh, you know, say negative things to them if you can't say positive things to them. If you cannot help, do not do harm. Don't hurt them more. Don't hurt them further. Third thing, there is help out there in every country, in every city. If not in your city, in nearby city. If you think your loved one needs help, seek help. Try to find out where are the, nor the nearby places where you can help. In what ways you as a person can help if you want to help them. If you don't know how to, contact us. We will tell you how to help them. If they are around us, we will go and look for them. We will try and see, see if we can help them in any way we can. Um, I try and put a lot of literature out there. Uh, every day I post something or the other, except past two days. I've been uh, only posting about our show. Uh, try and learn before you, you know, you try and react negatively. Even if it is kids, uh, parents who are worried about their teenagers, maybe they don't know their friend circle very well and they want to know more about their friend circle or if they are using, even if it is a normal cigarette. There are ways of learning how to talk to your, to your youth if you don't know. There, there is so much out there that you can learn. And by learning, you can not only help yourself, but you can pe help people around yourself. When you say there's so much out there, you're literally just talking about just Googling it, right? Just actually just sitting with your laptop and just putting it to Google, how do I bring up yes, this conversation yes. with my child? I, I, so I use a lot of YouTube where uh, counselors, different counselors are uh, teaching us how to talk to, for example, a teenager. If you want to talk to your teenager and find out what are his views about drugs, or if you're worried, is he using, is not using, how do you bring up this conversation? As I told you earlier, that you can talk about hearing a story about somebody, a friend's uh, a child who was affected by drugs. What do you think about it? So you think there's something that we can do in the society. That way, slowly, you'll come to know what are their views about drugs. I suppose I just asking them. I suppose I I would just ask my child if you ever you know um, got into you know something like you know drugs or something, would you feel comfortable coming and telling me about it or talking to me or discussing it with me and actually just seeing what their reaction to that is, because yes, you're asking them straight absolutely. out, so you're not judging them, you're not asking yes. them if they're on. You're saying if you were, would you feel comfortable talking to me? Yes. And if not, why not? What what can I change in that? How can I make it that you know you would feel comfortable talking to me? Absolutely. That way you will also know it, it's not only about drugs, it is about how it you is. react to different situations and you can learn how to, you know, maneuver around that and maybe, you know, even even involve them. People are scared to even come to rehab centers. But recently, Alhamdulillah, people have been coming with their kids. I take my son, a five year old, to my rehab whenever I can and uh, you know they they always ask me taking your child there there's no drugs there he comes to you know and my clients love him because there is you know there's therapy even in child laughter and he you know plays with water he with a fountain and he will clean the car my car with them and he will water the plants so he's learning but they are also enjoying the company of a child Remember, they are out of home, so they miss that home environment. And as I, as I said, it's important that we make that environment a bit homey so that they feel that, you know, there is, I could have this life, you know? Yeah, so, no, for sure. No, that's brilliant. Someone's actually asked here, how many cases would there be in our Koja community in, in our Islam? And if you can provide us a breakdown by gender. Okay, so I only deal with male, as I uh, earlier had said. 
uh, I don't have specific numbers because I I haven't done a survey of knowing how many are out there. I wish I could, uh, but I would say more than 50% of my clients, of 20 clients that I, I saw and released this year were Koja. Oh, wow. Okay, so it, it's quite high then because if you're looking at only 20 and 50% of them were, were Kojas, then it, that, that shows that it is quite within the Koja community. And it might be because of the, the environment or the way we have kept it as a, you know, a homey environment uh, or people who can afford. But I would say the problem is huge. I'm not talking only about Koja. The problem is huge. But maybe those who could afford were mostly Koja. And again, I'm, uh, our rehab is very new. So the mm -hmm. word is still spreading uh, along the normal population. But of course, in Koja community, they come to know faster because of our circle. Mm -hmm. My inner circle mostly are Koja, so they, the word spread faster in Koja community, while the uh, the other, the bigger society out there still doesn't know. Do you feel that um, because you're a Koji and and you're running a center, it's like if if you know if, if a Koja is is addicted to drugs, they wouldn't want to go to a center where yes. Kojas yes. are working because then other Kojas will find out, and therefore then so do you do you yes. find that as well? Yes, that has happened as well. That uh, I found out about uh, uh, a boy who was using, and when I approached the family, they said, "No, no, 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 you must be mistaken. It's not true." So even when telling them that, okay, can I provide you some information that can help your child? But why do we need the information when I'm telling you I'm confirming that my son doesn't use? While it's a, it was a known case. But uh, again, they don't have to come to me. Help is out there. That is what is the main important thing. Let's get this thing sorted. Because if we don't talk about it right now, trying to prevent it, going to schools and preventing it, talking about it in madrasa and schools, or in the mosque, there's nothing wrong about talking about it, then the problem will become bigger, decade or so. Okay. So before we finish off, um, some of the advice that you've given us, one is um, not to judge um, in any situation, forget about it just being drugs, but in any situation not to be judged. Um, second was, um, if you can't help, then don't harm. Um, and, and I think, again, that's in any situation. I think, you know, a lot of the times people will say things without realizing the impact of those words. And a lot of times we'll say something that can be quite hurtful. Um, and if we just took a, a few seconds to think about those words before we said them, then, you know, um, we would cause a lot less ha harm to other people. Um, the third one, sorry, I can't remember. What was the last advice that you gave? I'm just trying to Seek recall help. it. Help Seek around. Help. Seek help, seek help. And again, like you said, um, you know, it, it doesn't matter where you go, but I, I'm sure it, it 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 must help to be um, in in a center where your not only your religion is understood, but your culture is understood as well when you're trying to get help, because that does a, a lot of you know a lot of the pressures that we feel is because of our upbringing from our culture, from our religion, and and you know all of these things do um, cause uh, stresses on us as well and the way we view them and so a lot of the times to break those stresses or to break those pressures and to sort of make us think of those in a different way we need to have yes. someone who understands the culture and the religion that we come from yes and when I did have uh, many Koja boys we it was Muharram so we used to take them to mosque during those wow. 10 days, we took them for Urbane. We, we took them for the procession as well. We also tried to have Jama'a Namaz in our uh, center just to, you know, to have that feel and to bring them back into the religion. And Alhamdulillah, majority of them, it's not that they don't believe in God. They yeah. do. Uh, but uh, in one way or the other, they had a bad company or they slipped away. And our job is to pull them back. Yeah. yeah, so it does make a difference, definitely. Not give up on them, like like God doesn't give up on us, so we shouldn't give up yes. on others. Definitely. Inshallah. Inshallah. It's been absolutely amazing um, talking to you, uh, Dr. Shaina. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your experiences, and thank you so much for caring enough about our, our, our community to open up 
a rehab center. I think that's amazing, the work that you're doing. Um, inshallah, God Thank give you lots of lots of um, blessings for that and, and guidance through that. And inshallah, you're able to open up the 24-7 um, call line that you're hoping to open up, inshallah. Again, um, those of you who didn't hear, the, the center, the clinic is called the uh, Awaited, after our 12th Imam, the Awaited Rehab Center, and it's based in Dar es Salaam. Um, please Google it. Please, you know, um, look at it in social media, like it, um, you know, get connected. And like as, uh, Dr. Shaina says, she does post lots of information there. So, again, please look it up and, and you know, inshallah, we can all um, gain a little bit of knowledge and, and sort of start talking about these these um, taboo subjects, inshallah. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for the views, uh, for listening once again to Real Talk. Inshallah, we will uh, take a break now because um, next Sunday is Easter and then the Sunday after that is um, the last weekend before my Ramadan. So I'm sure everyone will be very busy trying to get prepared for my Ramadan. So we'll take a break till after my Ramadan. And again, for anyone who's interested in being a guest on uh, Real Talk, uh, who you know, uh, please get in touch with uh, myself, Masma Jafar. Um, on masma at jaffa.org and for anyone who knows anyone who you know who's quite inspirational and you would you would think they would make an amazing guest please get in touch and i will then contact them and, and ask them to be a guest um so thank you very much for watching and um inshallah please remember each other in the holy month of shaban and my ramadan inshallah thank you